Today in the Worship Anywhere broadcast, we're going to be answering one of the most frequently asked questions that we get at Surprise Church. Why doesn't Surprise Church own property? As part of our Good Question series, that's the one we're leaning in on today, and it's going to get to the very heart of our definition of what a church truly is. I'm Pastor Matt, and this is Worship Anywhere. So great to be with you again this week, wherever you're watching from, Bismarck, Mandan, Lincoln, Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, wherever you're from, so, so honored that you'd be with us today. Um, before we dive in, I want to raise something up called the Joy 10 Challenge that we do every, a couple times a year at Surprise. Um, it's, but it's been a little while since we've done our last uh, Joy 10 generosity experiment. Here's the deal. There's an ancient biblical practice that God called Israel to practice that that's called tithing, and that is tithing is a, is a is a word that means giving ten percent of your income to the house of God, the local church. And these another way of rephrasing it was first fruits. And God challenged His people, called His people to give their first fruits to God. And then He said, "Actually, test me and see if I don't bless you back." It's kind of like if you trust me with this, I'm going to make your life uh, a, a, a holy in a way that that demonstrates that I respond to your trust. And so many people don't do it because of maybe a financial concern and maybe because they mistrust the church that might be asking for that. So the generosity experiment is a 60-day trial, a, a way of experimenting with tithing, and we take those two big barriers off the table. So number one, we have a, a give-back promise, 100% give-back. After 60 days, if, if a person says this was a mistake, we will refund 100% of their gift. Secondly... Um, if someone says, I mistrust anybody who says to do this because I'm concerned about their motives and asking, we allow someone to designate another church that they would like to receive this gift because it's not about our need, it's about your long-term growth. So if you would like to test drive tithing, this ancient powerful practice that I have seen so many people try and never regret, you can text the word joy to that number and uh, we'll give you an immediate text and an email with some information and follow up with some resources. So check that out. Anyway, like I said, we are in the middle of our good question series. You have been texting us questions and we have been providing answers, thoughts, and ideas. Our goal hasn't been to answer every question, but to give you some things to think about in some of the frequently asked questions that people might have. We talked about why bad things happen. Last week, we talked about how do you know God's will. You can go back on our Surprise Church Bismarck YouTube page if you'd like to reclaim some of that real estate if you saw it already or if you didn't, check it out. They're real helpful messages. Um, Today, we're going to shift gears a little bit. One of the most frequently, if not the most frequently asked question that we get to Surprise is, is why doesn't Surprise own property? And think about it. Most people grew up, if they grew up in the church, their church was called the building. The building was the church. And so that they go to a place that's actually renting or in a school and they're like, well, this is neat to start out, but when are you going to be a real church? When are you going to get your own building and all that stuff? So that's a regular conversation that we get. And I always appreciate those because it gets, gives us a chance to talk about our mission and it gives us a chance to talk about Jesus' mission. So we're gonna look at scripture right now and, and really start looking at where Jesus began to talk about his church. And so look at Matthew 16. He's with his disciples. He says, who do you guys think that I am? And they said, well, some people think you're this and some people think you're that. And Simon Peter, who's kind of the leader of the disciples, answered, you are the Messiah or the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. The Greek word he uses here is the word ekklesia, which is a, a commonly used word that we'll get into that in a minute in, in Greco-Roman circles. On this rock, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so Jesus tells Peter that, that upon what he just said, that you are the Christ, you're God's son sent to save the world. I'm gonna build my church on that, that belief in who I am. And you're going to have my authority in the world. 
to try to make the world look more like heaven. You're going to have a chance to unlock broken and locked up lives. And you're going to have a chance to build a bridge from heaven to earth. And then I love that he says, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Now, remember, the gates of a city were the part of a city that's attacked. And so he gives this image of an ecclesia, a church that's storming the gates of hell, this active, dynamic metaphor that he's going to build that kind of church. Now, Simon immediately misunderstands what he means. He says that he's going to build something. So that one of the next things Simon Peter does is talk about buildings. Look at this. In the next chapter, Matthew 17, this is what's called the transfiguration of Jesus. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and, and led them up a high mountain by himself, by themselves, rather. There, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Then, some dead guys show up. Then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, these pillars of the Old Testament, heroes of faith, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter, Peter doesn't want to leave. Peter doesn't want that moment to end. Peter looks down at the valley where all the problems are. He looks down at the valley where the devil is and evil is and injustice is and poverty is and he doesn't want to go down there again. He wants to make some shelters for Jesus, Moses, Elijah, probably would build 12, three other ones or 12 other ones for the and this would be where they would escape all that. Peter's first impulse is to build structures to isolate holy people on the mountaintop. And, and that's always been kind of a fortress mentality that people of faith have, have had to guard against. Uh, and look at this picture. This is in Portugal. I, I vis visited some churches in Portugal that looked almost identical to this. This is Roman cathedral architecture that was built all around Europe. Um, and look at the top. You see those teeth on top of that cathedral? That's what would be on top of a castle where, where bowmen, where... where, where um, People shooting arrows would, would hide behind cement and concrete and shoot the enemy as they attack the fortress. Peter's sort of giving rise to this fortress mentality where if we build this structure, we can isolate ourselves, protect ourselves from the world. And I think many Christians over history have struggled with this fortress mentality. We've struggled uh, uh, with thinking the world is an evil, awful place, and God's calling us to withdraw rather than what Jesus just said, to attack and storm the gates of hell. The very next thing that happens after this scene is that they walk down the mountainside together and they confront a demon that his disciples couldn't figure out how to, get, how to deal with. But Jesus wants us in the valley. He doesn't want us without him. He wants us with him in the highways and byways and valleys of life, not in some sort of cloistered off fortress. So Peter misunderstands when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Peter thinks, building, when Jesus was actually talking about something else. He used the word ecclesia. Now, in Roman culture, this word meant something specific in Greek and Roman culture. Citizens in cities like Athens, um, near the Acropolis in the city of Athens, they had... Um, about 5,000 citizens get together on a hillside amphitheater every week or so, about 40 times a year. And they would um, meet together to decide on war, foreign policy, update laws, they'd evaluate public officials. They were deputized officially by the emperor of Rome to help Romans be good Romans, right? That was what they meant at the time by ecclesia. If the ecclesia in a city was a call, it literally means called out, a group of men, at this time men, could, the only people could be citizens, a group of men or individuals or citizens called out of the city, gathered to make decisions that made the city better, to govern, to oversee, and to implement the emperor's will to help Romans be good Romans. Now, Jesus steals that word. He didn't make it up. He did not make up the word ecclesia. He stole it from Rome. <laughs> he, 
He also uses other words to refer to his people. He says that his people are like leaven or yeast. If you have a jar of yeast, you, you're, you, it's not going to do anything unless you actually put it into the bread. Leaven doesn't do its work in a jar. He uses light for his people, which he also said, don't put light under a basket because it's not going to be able to glow. It has to be put high for the world to see. He, he used water for his people, which goes bad when it's stagnant and not moving. He used salt, which he said is useless if it's diluted or if it's confined to something not used as it should be. He also used army imagery, as he did here in Mark 16 with Peter and the disciples. But armies are only powerful if they're trained and deployed. Otherwise, if, they, if you promise to never use and never train your army, they're good for nothing. Jesus used all of these dynamic, active images for his people, and then he used the term ecclesia, this called out community that's called to do something, but not what Rome wanted Ecclesia to do, something similar to that. Jesus' Ecclesia, in the words of a fantastic church leader called, named Ed Silvoso, uh, Jesus' Ecclesia is a, was a buildingless, mobile people movement operating 24 7 to impact everything and everyone, to inject the leaven or the yeast of the kingdom of God into the dough of society so that first people, then nations, and eventually, or excuse me, first people, then cities, and eventually nations would be discipled. That's the ecclesia, the, the hell-attacking ecclesia that Jesus was talking about to Peter not little shelters and little huts on a mountaintop, not a fortress to hide from the world, but a movement that would transform the world to make it more, look more like heaven. But then something happened. Uh, this movement took hold so powerfully as people operated in their homes, in their neighborhoods, and in new cities. They would move into new cities. They didn't necessarily own anything other than their homes, and they, they just enveloped the Roman Empire until at some point in 313 AD, just about 300 years later, the Roman emperor actually decided to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. So they went from a backwater, backwoods, enemy of the state, small band of people getting persecuted to being the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. And they were made official by Emperor Constantine in 313. That led to large cathedrals being built that took centuries and huge fortunes. People were taxed to build huge structures for the church slash government. Power hierarchies emerged and institutions developed that controlled and managed resources. Clergy class emerged so that Religion was handled by the professionals. There were actually seasons throughout the history of the church where no one was allowed to speak in church. No one was allowed to sing except professionals. So a professional class developed. And the ecclesia that Jesus was talking about it went from a movement to location. It went from a community and a movement to a location. Eventually, the term, the German word Kirche replaced the term Ecclesia, and that's where we get the term church, the German word Kirche. So, so this has really caused Christianity to struggle over, over time because what Jesus started started to get diluted. It's, the light started to get darker. The salt started to get diluted. The, the water started to get just confined to a space and events rather than a 24-7 movement and lifestyle. Since then, Christianity has really struggled, especially in the West. It, it struggled with the idea uh, that people would come to a building and a program led by professionals rather than people would grow and go into the world for Jesus. People would consume instead of make disciples. People would critique, oh, I like that song, I didn't like that sermon, oh, I like that building, I didn't like that design, that decoration, whatever. People would critique rather than focus on being a transform agent in their homes and community. Church was a casual option 
among many busy options. So the church attendance has gone over the last couple decades from the average person has gone three times a month to two to one to sometimes just every few months I might pop in. It's become a very casual thing rather than a committed lifestyle. It's been confined to a place, to a single place, maybe for an hour every week or two or three, and not been defined by God's people out in the world. It's also become irrelevant in large measure to many people because when you just take something in your life and you make it this tiny little bubble and box in the corner, it doesn't relate to or apply to or connect with the vast swath of everything else you do and everything else that you're about. And instead of being irrelevant, the church was called to be irresistible. The first people didn't join the church because they needed something else to do and that it was irrelevant to their life. It was irresistible. It drew them in because of the kind of community that they were, the kind of irresistible movement that they became, and it met needs. Andy Stanley, in his book Deep and Wide, asks the question, are we an ecclesia or are we a kirke? Are we a movement or a place? Are we a movement or a meeting as a church? Are we impacting our city or are we just meeting in our city? Some churches are simply plopped down in suburbs that are growing so that they hope to capture the urban sprawl and that more people will move there, more people will attend the services at their location and give money so they can build programs. That what a watered down version of church that is. Are we organized around our mission or are we organized around events? Are we using our resources to share Jesus or to appease squeaky wheels? You have no idea how many churches struggle with trying to figure out how do we obey Jesus with all the, the maybe the, the insiders making demands about this is my favorite program or I think we should do this or I think we should do that. And it's a real challenge in church if you're focusing on church as a kirke rather than an ecclesia. So it's a surprise we get together with our team every year and we pray about our mission. We pray to make sure that God would give us a mission that we'd stay stubbornly focused on it. Um, and that's easier said than done, but let me share what our vision and our mission is for this year. This year in 2022, we endeavor to equip 200 people to create a spiritual growth plan within a group or a team. So we want 200 people within our surprise family to be a part of a group, ideally, or a, a serving team. And as part of their life uh, as uh, among that, that, that group or team, they'll create a plan for their, their own spiritual growth because we know that growing people change lives and cities. Other goals we have is this year we want to reach three new cities with, with groups that can start and start reaching people. And we've already done that in Washburn, North Dakota. We have uh, two or three groups launching in the Twin Cities to help us reach people there, talking to people in other cities as well. Um, we're really excited to share our resources with people in new cities. We want to reach 2,000 more people locally, and we're doing that through things like Camp Kindness and Faces of Easter and through our community groups as they just people are just invited and reached and um, subscribe to our email list, and we just start relating to them digitally before we relate to them in person. And then we want to expand our budget. We want to have more resources to fuel our mission. So we want to help people, as they grow in faith, learn how to steward their resources and leverage them towards what what God has called us to do. If you haven't yet taken your own spiritual growth assessment, here's the information for that. This is a great place to start. We want to make sure that people are in a group or team with this growth uh, assessment that helps them make a spiritual growth plan, and we would strongly commend that to you. Within three years, check this out, (coughs) within three years, We want to reach 316 people to make sure that they're a part of a group or a team with a a plan for growth. And we want to reach 20 new cities. We want to have an impact on the lives of 10,000 people locally where they maybe have subscribed for resources that they look to us, whether they attend or not yet, they look to us as a church that's here to help. And they've used resources, they've attended an event, or they've just um, been blessed by us somehow. And we want to not just expand our own personal generosity, we want to explode our generosity. We want a budget that doesn't just allow us to to do what we need to do. We want a budget that allows us to look at opportunities and say, we can do that because we have a radically generous community. So all of this is to say, why why doesn't Surprise own property? Uh, Two quick answers. Number one... Um, We're not against it at all. We have uh, regular conversations. Our elder board routinely talks and prays about it. Um, We are always open to what God's got planned for us. But our mission is central. Our mission is to be a healthy and impactful ecclesia, not a stagnant kirke. So everything we do, everything we own, and we do own plenty of property, supplies, equipment, whatever, everything we purchase must only help us accomplish this mission 
rather than get in the way or prevent us from doing that. And so we evaluate any sort of questions about where we worship, how we worship, and, and what we do and don't own based upon, is this going to help us better accomplish the, the goal and the vision we just talked about? Or could this hinder us from that? And if so, it's not helpful. So that's the lens that our elders are thinking and praying. Now, here's the second answer to the question that I think is even more fun. Why doesn't surprise own property the second answer is, if we are an ecclesia, we do own property. And I mean a lot of property. We are incredibly rich in terms of property. If we are a movement, not a location. Here's what I mean by that. These are just a few pictures of the real estate in which people at Surprise work. Some of them own, some of them work there. Some of them go to school there. This is our property. These are the places God has given us to minister. If we are not a location, if we are a movement, this is our space. These are our places. These are not irrelevant to who Surprise Church is. This is where we do church as we minister to people, build relationships, bless people, do our best work to build a trustworthy world, honor our colleagues and coworkers, share Jesus however we can, and look to invite people into this family, these spaces are our property. Now you might say, okay, we don't own them, not all of them. You're right, but we do own a lot of property. I wanna show you a video right now of Anne. Anne Green is a member of one of our community groups that meets in homes. Anne's got a lot to say about what happens when the church leaves the building. Check this out. The first reason for thinking, well, how do I how do I grow in this, how do I grow in this journey was how do I internalize the message? How do I not just hear it on Sunday morning, but let it resonate with me throughout the week? Take those snippets out of the message and apply them. You know, the, the application of going to church on Sunday. How do I become a seven-day Christian and not, and not a Sunday morning Christian? Joining a community group, one of the things was we, we talk about the message. We talk about what happened on Sunday. And that's been really helpful for me to really think about what I want to take away from the message, what I want to talk about when we meet on Tuesday nights. Um, and that's been really helpful to me, to, to, to get perspective from the other women in the group about what they heard and how that differed from what I heard and what that means to us and what that means to the way that we live our lives or the way that we, that we, that we want to live our lives. I have connected and met with a group of women that I probably ordinarily would not have had an opportunity to meet. And that has been such a blessing, such a joy. Um, simply because they are a really diverse group from a, a, a lot of different backgrounds and it gives me the opportunity to to learn from them to learn about them to develop relationships to develop um you know people that i see at church where i'm like oh hey hi how's it going hey how was that thing that was going on last week are you feeling better or or what do you need or um, you know, the, the, the stuff that life is woven out of. The first, <laughs> the first week that I was supposed to go to a community group, I drove up and I didn't go in because I was scared, because I was uncomfortable, and um, I, 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 it just felt uncomfortable and I didn't do it. Well, I, I, I got over that and went the next time it took 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 a little bit of a, a bit of time but eventually i went and of course as soon as i walked in i was welcomed hey this is ann meet so and so meet so and so this is great this is fabulous come on in we're having dinner um and i was so welcomed immediately that it felt effortless to go after that it, it, it's worth a try it's worth giving yourself permission to try something different. But the fact that 
Thousands of years ago, people met in homes to develop relationship and to, to develop a relationship with God. At first felt really foreign to me. It felt really weird. Um, but it makes sense. It makes sense. There is a lot to be learned that you don't learn sitting in rows. There's a lot to be learned about people and about relationship and about the Sunday message and about and about God and about our relationship with God through other humans. Uh, and that has been really powerful to me. So if you're on the fence, do it. Like I said, Surprise owns a lot of property. Here's some, some of our properties. Here's our portfolio. Look at all these living rooms, kitchens, dining rooms. There's a coffee shop that we own where our men's meeting meet. Okay, we don't legally own it, but it's our space. We own lots and lots of space. The square footage in which we can do church is unbelievably huge. It's as many square feet as there is in our city and far beyond. So that's why we want to challenge you. If you haven't yet dove, dove into a community group, get in there because we want to expand our space. We want to enter into your living room. We want you to help enter into new neighborhoods and welcome people into a space over a kitchen table or a cup of coffee where they can be a part of the ecclesia and grow just like Anne did in her faith. I want to close with this. The Roman term apostle was another term that Jesus stole. A Roman apostle was an admiral in charge of a fleet of ships that would carry building materials and people who were sent out to build a city that looked like Rome. Jesus' apostles are kind of like that. He stole the term, he ripped it off, and he changed it. Jesus' apostles are sent to use God's resources and people to send to, to, to build a kingdom that looks like heaven. Jesus' apostles are sent to use God's resources and people to build a kingdom that look like looks a lot like heaven. So as we close, think about this question, am I willing to be sent? Surprise is based on the story of the prodigal son, a story that happens in a home. A man standing on his front porch waiting for his rebellious son to come home after the son spent half his dad's fortune. And when he saw him, he ran off his front porch. And instead of punishing him, instead of giving him rules, he gave him a hug and threw him a surprise party and welcomed him back into the family. We are called to do that in our homes. And as we celebrate Mother's Day, we celebrate the mothers who have made their homes a prodigal party. We're, we're called, we're sent to make our homes and our cities look more like heaven. And God will give us exactly what we need when we need it. So I want to thank you for being a part of the Surprise Ecclesia. We're not a kirka. Our goal is not to avoid owning things. It's not also, our goal isn't to own things. Our goal is to change things and to change lives, to change cities, to change nations. And I'm so glad that you are a part of that and we wanna help you get to the center of what it means to be a part of this movement. So hopefully that answers a little bit more of what's on our mind as leaders at Surprise and where this church is going. Thanks for being a part of it. We love you, God bless.